The real world experience with aquilizumab is something that we've been doing at our center um, with other medications that have been newly approved. So we did it with tingolimod, and we also did it with dimethyl fumarate. And these are kind of studies that we call real world observational studies. Um, and so I think sometimes we have to differentiate what efficacy is compared to what effectiveness is. Right? And so efficacy typically is determined in randomized clinical trials. They are very, you know, very strict methodology to do them. Um, the care is highly structured. Um, and patients are specifically chosen to participate in the study because of given reasons. And, uh, and the main purpose of an efficacy study is to demonstrate that the medication is effective and therefore the population you select is a patient that you think is going to be a good responder to the meds. Now once a medication is approved by the regulatory agencies, it kind of enters into clinical practice and we kind of start using it. And that's where I think effectiveness um, kind of comes into play. And that's not how does something work kind of in a clinical trial compared to something else. It's kind of how well does it work actually in real world scenario, right? Um, and so this is a study we did with aquilizumab. And so we kind of enrolled patients who were starting the medication. Approximately 750 patients were present in our cohort. And um, um, of those patients, we're presenting data on the, approximately the first 350 or about half of those patients that have six month follow up. Um, and I think the main aims of the study was to determine both the efficacy um, as well as um, safety and tolerability of the medication in, in, in clinical practice. And um, what we, our analysis focused on comparing what our population looked like um, in relapsed remaining MS compared to the phase three trials in relapsed remaining MS and looking at what our primary progressive population looked like compared to the phase three trial primary progressive study of acrylizumab. Um, and so in terms of kind of the baseline characteristics of the patients, they are quite different. So our patients in the relapsed remaining group are typically a little bit older. Um, and they also are patients who have a little bit less inflammatory disease activity. Um, many of those patients were transitioning from other medications and that may explain why they had a little bit more inflammatory, less inflammatory disease activity. Um, and I would say overall, they're patients that probably had been on you know, a larger number of medications um, than in clinical trials. So we think that it's a slightly more heterogeneous group. Um, the primary progressive group was um, uh, significantly older, and this is something that's a little bit of an issue. The aquilizumab phase three clinical trials had an age cutoff if you could get into a study. Um, and it turned out that about 24% uh, of patients um, had enhancing lesions at baseline in the aquilizumab phase three trial. So it was a substantial proportion of people. A lot of people think that aquilizumab works through anti-inflammatory effects, and therefore if you have a patient population where there's, you know, at least a quarter of the patients had active lesions and they were all, you know, younger patients under the age of 55, um, it's very different from what our experience is. So our experience is much older patients. The percentage of patients who had, um, uh, who had disease activity or had inflammation on their MRIs was much lower, was much lower. And so we think that probably will inform some differences in kind of the clinical outcomes. Because we're only presenting data at six months, it's a little difficult to comment on what the kind of clinical outcomes look like. But what we did uh, do is we did an analysis of kind of how well patients tolerated the infusions in terms of kind of their infusion reaction rate. And so what we found is that overall, the patients in our study had fewer infusion reactions than they did in clinical trials. We think this is probably due to a combination of factors. One is that we had a very specific standardized protocol that um, we used prior to and after giving the medication to avoid these hypersensitivity reactions and also to avoid the regular infusion reactions that we see with the medication. So that's probably one thing. Then there could be also something of a reporting difference, right? In a clinical trial, people are probably a little bit more on top of things reporting versus in clinical practice, um, we probably don't report you know, as aggressively. Um, we're not noting every single thing. But um, I think that the bottom line was that you know, very few patients in the relapsing remitting group had disease activity. Um, six months into the study. And the very few patients who did have disease activity were people who had it very early on um, after you know, starting the medication. And we know the medication takes several weeks before it comes act becomes active, um, and so that's not a surprise. We found that if anything, it was probably better tolerated in terms of its infusion reactions. Um, and in terms of kind of safety and infections, um, we mainly saw urinary tract infections and upper respiratory tract infections that was similar to the events reported in clinical trials. So I think it basically shows that even when you use the medication in relapsed urinating MS in a, you know, in a real world population that is outside the constraints of a clinical trial, it seems like the medication maintains its efficacy compared um, to clinical trials. In primary progressive MS, um, I would say that the population was quite different. 
Um, and the efficacy will have to be determined long term by kind of our near performance measures in terms of how, well, how much those patients progressed.